Look, hey, this morning, turn with me in your Bible. We're going to be right in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm in Ephesians chapter 4. Come on, look at your neighbor say, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I, I promise you that, uh, man, I, I feel like God has a word for us today. Come on, somebody. Come on. How many of y'all believe that God still speaks? God still speaks. I mean, how many of y'all believe that God still heals? He is the healer, man. He is the restorer of life. How many of you believe that we still serve a miracle-working God? I mean, I've seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. And, uh, man, I, this is another part that's really important that we need to understand. How many of you know that we, there's a real enemy out there? And, and he is trying. He's using every means possible in this season to quench the spirit of of God on the earth. And I believe that it's the responsibility of the church to press back. Come on, we can press back today. Come on, how about that? We're going to press back today. Everybody's in a book of Ephesians. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 24. It's a lot, but man, it's just, I think we need to read it. Amen. So if you will follow with me, we'll have some words up on the screen. Uh, if you have a Bible, open it there. If you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles in the chair back in front of you. You can have those. Somebody say amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I therefore, this is Paul speaking, and I'll try not to commentate the whole time I'm reading. It's really a challenge, but uh, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Let me look at your neighbors say, unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, therefore, he ascended, and what does that mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that we might fill, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the, of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. He says that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their un understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. 
But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, put off. That you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitfulness of lusts. Or to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man. Which was created according to God. In true righteousness and holiness. Come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, this day that we have. Lord, I pray that you strengthen us, that you edify us. Lord, as the body of Christ, as the family of Christ. Lord, I pray that you begin to transform our hearts, transform our minds. Lord, that you begin to just be in us as you promised. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been reading in our Bible plan in the book of, of Exodus recently. We've kind of transitioned from Exodus to the book of Leviticus. And, and, and this is really a story about God creating this people of his. He says, these are my people, this royal priesthood, this holy nation. And he's, and he's creating this, the people of God, right? And, and, and we can learn a lot about our own walk, about our own faith, when we say, Lord, what does it mean to be the people of God? Come on, how many of you believe you're the people of God? Come on, raise your hand. I mean, I, we are the people of God. For, I mean, it's not like there's a government agency out there that, where they have a cabinet member who goes, sits on the, on the presidential cabinet that represents the people of God. You, we can't lean on the government. There's not an educational system that says training on the people of God. The people of God are here. Like we are the people of God and we need to know what does it mean to be the people of God. And, and I believe that, that, that as we read through this, we see some marks of the believers, some marks of what it means to be God's children. And how many of y'all know that, that you're marked? I mean, I know like, man, there's a lot of talk now, like nowadays about the mark of the beast, right? Man, is this the mark of the beast? Is that the mark of the beast? Friend, I, I, I'm not, I mean, listen, I have some thoughts on all of that, but I'm more concerned about having the mark of Christ on my life by being covered in the blood of Jesus. And I know that if I stay covered in the blood of Jesus, then I don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. The, the, the enemy's been preparing the world for that mark for thousands of years. But Christ has conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. And it's time for the church to realize that. I don't, I don't want to get too far off of that, but I believe that God is calling the church, and this is the message today, is to radical unity. Come on, radical unity. Come on, not just unity when unity is convenient. I mean, I, how many of y'all like, there's a, there's a group, a small group of people who you kind of like hanging out with. How many of y'all have some of those? Okay, put your hands down. Be honest. How many of you, there's a group of people that you really don't like hanging around with? Yeah. You know what, you know what the Bible says? We need to, oh, come on, man. You know, I don't believe you for a second. Uh, he says that we need to be in unity with those who we don't even like. And, and as, as Christians, as believers, to, to see the world, and, and to see the church go into to its calling and fullness, that we have to get this understanding that, that we've got to learn to love those who are hard to love. And we need to walk in radical unity. And what does it mean, radical? I mean, that, that word gets thrown around. Come on, we have radical Muslims and radical left, the radical right. But come on, uh, I want to see in the news where people start talking about the radical Christians that are changing the world, that are restoring hearts, that are renewing the vision and purpose of a nation. I was talking to a pastor a couple of weeks ago, and he, he had mentioned about, he says, man, like uh, we're just trying to figure out this online church thing. I was like, brother, we're still trying to figure out the in-person church thing. I mean, we need to figure out this church thing. We've been working on it 2,000 years, and I don't think we've gotten there yet. 
We need to love to love. We need to learn to love one another as Christ loved the church. What does it mean to be radical? I love this, just this definition. Radical simply means very different from the usual or traditional. Come on, radical unity. Very different from the traditional or the usual. It also means favoring extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or institutions. Come on, we need to become a people who are intentional about unity. We need to be in a, a people who are intentional about building bridges uh, to, to those who are difficult to love. Because, man, we've all been there. I've been difficult. I may be even difficult to love right now. I don't know. Somebody needs to tell me if I am. It's okay. Shannon says it's okay. But, so Paul, in the book of Ephesians, he goes through this, this thing. He said, you need to be, you, there needs to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Then he talks about the unity of the faith that we can walk in a measure of the fullness of Christ. But we have a responsibility to walk in unity. Paul tells us, he says, to put off the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. So in order for us to walk in unity, we need to learn to put some things off because how many of you know we're in a battle and there's several ways to fight a battle? I mean, so right now, even the United States, even though we're not directly in conflict it, it, over there in Russia, we are, we are d putting some battle fronts up in, in the form of sanctions. How many of y'all seen we're putting sanctions out there? And, and I feel like today that we need to officially put some sanctions against the work of the enemy. I, I mean, it's almost like we... We enter into this battle, this Christian faith, like I'm going to be saved and I'm going to do this thing, but yet we still allow the enemy to work within our battle, within our, our, our front. Like we, we'll sit there and still allow the enemy to continue to dwell amongst our, our people. So today I just want to put some sanctions and you can join with me in these, but I believe that the enemy's tactics is breaking the, down the unity within the church. I mean, this is, this is the battle we're in. Man, listen, the enemy's, his whole tactic is to divide and conquer. And we need to understand that. And, and we don't just need to be unified for unity's sake. We need to be unified because we need to be accountable to people. We need to have people in our life that will be honest with us. We need to have people in our life that will encourage us. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to make you offended. He wants to make you bitter. He wants to give you some perfectly legitimate reason why you should leave the church, why you should leave that fellowship, why you should do something else. But friends, I'm here to tell you today, there's one reason why you shouldn't do it, and His name is Jesus. And Jesus calls us to radical unity. And we need to issue some sanctions. It's like today, I want to issue some sanctions against the devil. Is that okay? I mean, before we get into the real message, just kind of some, some sanctions. So right now, if you could just stand with me. Let's just do it this way. Stand with me to your feet. If you want to issue these sanctions with me, and, and, and this is just, we're going to put some, draw some battle lines, if that's okay. Okay? So right now, come on, I, I just, we're, I'm going to read these and pray. I don't know what, how to do this sometimes. I just go with what, the, what God tells me. So right now, I just want to issue a sanction against the enemies of our soul that, that there will be no emotional equity uh, allowed from the enemy into the life of the church. Like right now, come on, how many of y'all agree with that? That we'll not allow any offense, any anger, any bitterness, any misunderstanding. Come on, we're not going to allow any emotional equity from the enemy into the life of the church. And right now, so right, could you lift up your hands right now? Heavenly Father, come on, come into agreement with this. Lord, I don't know it all. I don't understand it all. But I know the enemy wants to divide me. I know the enemy wants to separate me from my calling. And right now, we come into unity and we issue no Notice to the devil himself through the blood of Jesus that well there will be no offense in this house in Jesus' name. Lord, I put a sanction on that stuff. Lord, it's not welcome here. Lord, that there is no anger. There is no bitterness against past hurts. Lord, I, I, I issue a sanction against, against past hurt. I issue a sanction against ungodly beliefs and ungodly thought processes within the life of this church in Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, that there is misunderstanding. Lord, I will not allow misunderstanding to drive me away. Lord, give me a, just a spirit of boldness and courage. 
Lord God, to address the hard issues. Lord, don't let me be driven away by the things I don't understand. Lord, no emotional equity in the life of the church. Come on, right now, I want to issue a sanction against that because the enemy is trying to bring disunity into the church. So I want to issue a, a, a sanction on media. Come on, I want to put a, a, I want to censor the media. You say, oh, Joe, censorship. But I, how many of you realize that there are, the media has become a prevailing spirit in the region? You don't realize that? Maybe some of you don't. That's why you're in the trouble that you're in. There is a prevailing spirit of the media, that, that the spirit of the media that is, that is beginning to contaminate the minds and hearts of, a, of the whole world. Come on. Come on, we're going to put a sanction against false truths and lies. We're going to put a sanction against perversions and deceptions. Come on, I want to put a sanction against the pornographic industry in Jesus' name. Come on, right now, Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I come against the pornography industry. I come against every lie, every deception, Lord, every wicked word that is spoken through media. Lord God, that right now, people, kids, will begin to not turn and open up their Facebook, but they'll begin to open Open up the book, the Word of God. Lord, that they will not begin to get their information from Instagram, Lord, but they will be discipled and raised up in the way that they should go. Lord God, we issue a declare and decree right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that no more will media have a power over the church, Lord, but the church will rise up and will stand up against those wicked works in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, right now, I just want to issue a sanction an economic sanction. How many of you know that the enemy, there's a, there, there's the, the enemy is trying to steal the finances of the world. I mean, listen, God don't need your 10%. I just want you to know that that's an act of obedience. That's an act of trust. Well, God is the God who has the cattle on a thousand hills, right? The enemy don't even, ain't even worried about your 10%. Come on, he's more concerned about that 90% that you don't cover in the blood. He's more concerned about the things that you just frivolously do it. You drive down the road and there is advertisement after advertisement after advertisement. We live in a consumer society that is under the influence of a demonic spirit that is trying to steal the finances of God. So right now, I just want us to issue a sanction, financial sanction, on the stewardship of kingdom finances. That the enemy would no longer steal my finances through broken desires. Not a Listen, I want to pray right now that the enemy get his hands out of my pocket. Come on, I want, the, I want the enemy to get his hands out of my pocket. Come on, if you agree with that right now, just lift up your hands. Heavenly Father, we come into agreement as the body of Christ. Lord, we stand as one in unity. Lord, and we just declare and decree right now that the enemy has no hold over the financial markets in, uh, of the world. Lord, that the enemy has no hold over my finances. Devil, get out of my pockets in Jesus' name. Lord God, the things that God has given me, Lord, are his. Lord, 100% of it. Lord, I cover all of my money in the blood of Jesus. Lord, every resource that I have. Devil, get your hands off of my resources. Lord, and we stand on the word and we issue a sanctuary against the devil. Devil, you have no right and no authority to my money, to his money in Jesus' name. Come on, I, I just want to, we got two more of these. Come on, I just want to issue a sanction, a united sanction right now. I want us to stand in unity uh, against this spirit of racism that is, that is condemning our world today. I mean, it's like, it's so confusing and so misunderstood. It's like people are just on the edge about everything. And I believe that it's just spirit. I mean, we have to realize we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and these spirits of this dark and evil age. And we need to come in. Can you imagine? Like, like the, the, the world is in this great battle and the warriors that God has called to the battle are just sitting in pews and chairs, listening to some guy preach. Like we need to begin to declare, to, to declare war on the enemy. Like the church is the battlefront. So right now we just issue a sanction on racism, on, on bigotry, on hatred, on nationalism. 
Come on, we issue a sanction. The enemy, you have no right. Come on, let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, you... We, we come to you, Lord, and we just, well, by your authority, by your power, in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, Lord, we come against the spirit of, of racism, the spirit of bigotry, the spirit of hatred, Lord, the spirit of nationalism. And I'll just tag this on, the spirit of religiosity that has come from this, Lord God. Lord, and we stand on the word of truth. Lord, we stand with our brothers and with our sisters, Lord God, in the work of Christ. Lord, as a unified body, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. One more, I, I just want to issue a sanction on, on gossip in Jesus' name. Man, I can preach a whole message on gossip, but I won't. But, but, but this is what gossip is. It's basically, gossip is just something that you sharing stuff that you have no right to share. Uh, I'm not going to step on everybody's toes right at one minute, but it's sharing things that you have no right or authority to share. And, and how do we come against this spirit of gossip? Well, we're going to learn to honor and we're going to learn to respect people in the name of Jesus. Friends, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you come against any one of these people in these chairs, you're coming against the Lord and Savior, who we are part of the body of Christ. And you want to condemn and you want to come against those who are part of the body of Christ, you might as well cut off your own toe or your own finger friends gossip is wicked gossip is evil gossip is condemning and i just declare and decree that it is stopped in jesus name lord i pray that we learn to treat others the way that we want to be treated lord lord i, I want us to begin to break off this spirit where we begin to allow anger and bitterness to rise up within us because we've heard something about somebody lord there is a pandemic of gossip in the land lord Lord, it's just this irresponsible sharing of information, Lord, and we just come against it, Lord, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated. Come on, hallelujah. I know that, man, some, some of y'all may think, man, it's not important. This is important stuff. We got to let the, net, the devil know that you can't have the unity that God is creating in this house. We got to let the devil know, Braylon. Ain't nothing can come between us. You can get mad at me. I can get mad at you. But there ain't nothing coming between us. But we're standing together every day from this day till, till God brings us home. And we need to have that mind. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to develop a spirit of unity, radical unity, within the house of God. So what really defines the people of God? And, and I believe the story of Exodus tells us this. He says it's this radical stewardship, this radical obedience. And we've preached on these the past couple of weeks, this radical faith and this radical unity. So what is unity? Unity is the quality or state of being of not being multiple. It's the quality or state of not being multiple. It's, it's a condition of harmony is another definition. It's the quality or state of being made one. And, and here's my first point, if you want to. Jot this down. Unity does not mean the same, but it does mean together. Unity doesn't mean the same, but it does mean together. I'll just say it one more time because I need to put, start putting these up on the screen. Unity does not mean the same, but it does mean together. And this is what happens. How many of y'all heard that saying, birds of a feather flock together? And, and what happens is we, we get around people who are like us and similar to us they operate like us and then we go start our own church and we kind of just build this church of all the people who just look like me and that's not how it's supposed to work like the church should be full of people with multiple gifts with multiple talents with multiple things to be the fullness of christ as paul explains in the book of ephesians and we need to strive for that unity strive for that in the church quit being so offended because somebody operates a little different than you Quit being so angry because somebody said something that you don't understand. And in the book of, of Exodus, we see here that the people of God were unified in deliverance because, you know, we, we, we heard the story, all of the, the plagues and the, the miracles and all the things God brought the people of, of God out of the land of Egypt into this wilderness. And they were all unified. It's not like some of them stayed behind. They all left together 
as one, unified. You see, it's easy to rally around deliverance. It's easy to rally around salvation. Come on, it's easy to rally around spirit baptism. It's easy, it's easy to rally around the things that God does in our life. Why? Because, because these are good things. Like, I mean, how many of y'all love it when you see people give their heart to Jesus? I mean, I do too. And, and I remind people, I'll go to other churches, I'll say, brother, we are just united by the cross. You know, we may, not, we may have differences of opinion and separations, but it's the cross that, that unites us. And in Exodus, we see that the people of God were brought out through miracles of God. They all were brought out of Egypt. They all crossed through the Red Sea. They all heard God thunder from the mountain. They all saw this. They were all together, unified, one people. It's easy for the people of God to unify in deliverance. But the real question is, can they be unified in their identity of worship? You see, because what happened is, is God brought them out of the land of Egypt and he said, now I need you to begin to build the tabernacle, the place of worship, begin to build my church. And God meets with them. And let me tell you, at the first time God speaks to all the people, there was pandemonium and craziness. Like some of the people were still worshiping God and some of the people were building golden calves with Aaron. And, and it's kind of like that in the church. And the people who were building the golden calves probably felt perfectly justified in what they were doing. But they weren't unified under the vision and leadership of God. In Exodus, we read about this institution of the tabernacle. I mean, and you can go if you've read through that. I want to encourage you, if you haven't read through uh, with our Bible reading plan, we've moved our welcome center. It's now actually a welcome center. It has a welcome sign on it over into the living room lobby. We have some. So if you want to go there after church, if you're new, you want to go meet some people, that's a great place to go. But we have some brochures that have our Bible reading plan. I encourage you to read through that with us. But you would have read this week about, about the institution of the tabernacle. And God gives Moses all of these specific instructions. He says, because now I've brought you out of the land of Egypt, now I need to give you a new identity. Because your identity is broken. And although they're all okay with the deliverance part, come on, how many of you know they get in a little bit of trouble with the whole identity part? I've been around church for 20 years. Well, longer than that, really. I've been around church for probably my whole life. I was raised in church, but like played the drums at 12 years old, you know, in the church. And let me tell you, man, church people are weird. I've come to that conclusion. They are. They're weird. It's okay. We're called a peculiar people. That's part of our identity. And um, church people are weird. And it's hard to get church people to agree on things. And that shouldn't be the case. If anything, we should be the, it should be the exact opposite. We should be people of faith who operate in a, in a, in a presupposed situation of just divine and, and radical unity. But, but God began to issue these decrees to transform their identity so that they can know who they were so that way they could represent Him on the earth. So He gives them these instructions to build the tabernacle and and part of that will say, because now you need to know how to worship. You need to know how to sacrifice. You need to have a place where you can go and confess your sins, where you can find remission of sins. And this became uh, more than just their house of worship. This became their very identity. The, the people of God were identified by the tabernacle. Later, they, they became identified by their temple. Then later, right now, we're identified by an empty tomb. You see, in fact, there was a certain point in time where, where the church was the church building was actually the very center of a community. Some of y'all probably remember that. Like you go and and you still see if you go in a small town, there's like a post office and a church. Because this was a this is I mean a Christian nation at one point in time. I mean we can talk about whether it is or not now. I don't believe that it is. The church is declining and declining and declining because we've lost our identity. Maybe we have an individual identity, but the church's Lord has large has lost its identity. So in Exodus 35, 10, God gives these instructions, and then it says this. He says, All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all 
that the Lord has commanded. And God gives them these things. He, they built a tabernacle, which is this big tent. They built coverings and clasps and boards and, and, and pillars and sockets. They built the Ark of the Covenant. They built the showbread, the lampstand. They, built, they made oil uh, for light. They, they built the altar of incense. They built the golden labor, a screen. They built all of these things, this, every little detail they brought. And all of these things were working together to bring glory to God. Everything they built was to bring glory to God. Everything they did was to bring glory to God. It was this huge, massive undertaking, very expensive. They invested in it. And everything they did was to bring glory to God. And, and, and it was reminded me of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says this, And we know that all things work together for good, for the good of those who are called, who are called by God and those who are called according to His purposes. And, and I, just, I just realized that, that we're all called according to God, according to His purposes. It says all things work together for good. Here's, this is the interesting part. It says that all things work together. Friends, radical unity requires work. You know, it requires work. It requires sacrifice. It requires engaging. It requires endeavoring. We can't just say, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, act however I want to act, be however I want to act, and everybody just got to be okay with it. No, that's not how it works. You need to learn to work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to their purposes. Like, the minute, you, unity requires work. Like, like church requires work. And if you're not willing to do the work, you're probably not willing to be part of what we're doing. And that's not our fault, that's yours. Because unity requires work. Unity's hard. How many of y'all ever been married for more than five minutes? My marriage is perfect. We have absolutely no, I'm sorry, Lord. I, no. Marriage requires work. So the second point is for anything to be together, it has to work together. For anything to be together, it has to work together. I mean, marriage requires work. We have to, I mean, it, it, I was drawn to my wife, not because I knew that marriage was hard and it would require a lot of work, but there was a, this unknowing attraction. I was drawn to her by her beautiful, wonderful, amazing Everything. I mean, it was like, it was awesome. I had one of these moments in church where I remember it to this day. She was talking to some people and she's doing like this. And, and she, I was like, I don't know what she's doing, but my goodness, it's amazing. You know, I need to get to know this woman. And, and it was like, man, but, and I got to know her and made 20 years, almost 20 years later, we're still doing this thing. And it's like that in our faith. You know, it's like I, I, did, I did some research. I have some understanding of who Jesus is, but I really just came to Christ because I needed a savior. Like I needed deliverance. I needed help. But what happened is, is that now I'm saved. I'm delivered. Now God's got to start doing some work in me. Because for things to be together, they have to work together. Friends, it's the same thing in our faith. Whenever we give our heart to Jesus, we have to begin to change some things about us. And God gives us some instructions the same way He gave some instructions to the people of Israel in the book of Exodus. That, that, that idea says that all things work together. That term work together there in the Greek is synergeo, which is the same term we get from synergy. It's the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to bring I mean, to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. Basically, we're better together than we are apart. We can accomplish more together than we can apart. It says in the book of Matthew, it says where, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There's some power in our togetherness. And for us to be together, we have to work together. Man, I, I know you may not agree with everything that we do, but my goodness, I probably don't agree with everything that you do. It, let's not build walls around the things that we don't agree on. Let's build bridges around the things that we do. And, and let's begin to work together because the gospel requires work. And we are, are we not the body of Christ? Radical unity. Romans 12, 4 through 8 says this, For as, many, as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. 
man, that's a, that's a word right there. But there are some of you that do not operate. Shannon doesn't operate like me. And I have to learn to work within the parameters of how she operates. Not just get frustrated because I don't understand what she's saying. Besides, that would be awkward for me just leave and go to another church. Shannon's there, I'm leaving. But we're different. We have different functions. It's the same body. I mean, this is the body of Christ. So we being many, this is Paul in 12, verse 5. It says, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I mean, it's like our pastoral care ministry. We are invested into the success of one another. Man, we never, you know, we never leave someone behind. I've, I've had conversations with people who are walking away, stepping away from the faith. And it's like, brother, I'm not just going to let you do that easy. Because I love you. Your success is part of my success. Because we're united in Christ. So in verse 6, Romans 12, 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it. In our ministering, he who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We all have different gifts, but the same grace, and we have to work together in order to accomplish the good that God has for us. We have to work together. We can't, I mean, I don't need to say it again. I have an example. I just want to show you what working together. So I want to show you all something. This is a, this here is, is new-ish to me. And for how many of the guitar people we got in the house? Guitar people. This is a 1967 Brazilian Rosewood Gibson B25. You know, it's very valuable. My grandfather uh, left this to me. It was actually, they found it under his bed. They didn't know that it was, that he even had it. After he passed away, they found it under his bed. I was the only kid in the in the family that played the guitar, so they left it to me, you know. And uh, but it was in bad shape. The neck was warped, the the pickup was all rolled up, the the this uh, top part is was split. But thankfully, I have a, a cousin who's a luthier. He restored it, got it all new and wonderful and amazing. Doesn't it look beautiful? I mean, so it's amazing. And and I I, I kind of have this as like this is kind of a picture of my life. It really is. It was like, man, God found me under a bed somewhere because everybody had forgotten that I even existed. And, and man, he used Jesus to restore me and to make me look like an instrument again. And, and it was wonderful and it was amazing. But then I, I realized something that, you know, just like this instrument, it's been delivered. It's been restored. It's beautiful, right? I mean, it's very playable. So I just, I was like, man, I can use this as, a, as an instrument of worship. So if it's okay, I'd like to just, just use this and just show y'all. Man, it's like, and this is sometimes how our Christian faith looks. You know, it's like, oh man, we're saved, we're set free, we're restored, we look beautiful once again. Let me, I'm just going to begin to worship from my place of, of where I'm at and what God's done. And it's just like, how great is our God. And you just begin to... Can y'all hear that? Doesn't that sound wonderful? How great is our God. Man, y'all aren't singing with me. Okay. Maybe it doesn't sound as good as it looks. Oh, how great is our God. You see, so, so it's easy for us to get united in deliverance, right? It's wonderful. But how many of you know there's still work to do? You know, there's still work to do, and, it's, and, it's, it's, and our lives are a lot like this guitar. Sometimes, you know, some parts of our life, how many of you realize that this guitar is not in tune? For those of you who are tone deaf, sorry. You're like the musical co colorblind. But our life is like that. Like, but like, I have each string sounds wonderful by itself. But they sound great, but they're not in unity. They're not in one accord. They're not in harmony. So they need to be. So sometimes, sometimes we have to get ourselves in unity by, by comparing ourselves to others. Those who are next to us, loving our neighbor. 
That sounds pretty good. Man. This is just part of, the, part of the process. In our, even in our own lives, man, maybe we have anger issues. Maybe we have prayer issues. Maybe we have relationship issues, you know. And, and although we look great on the outside, man, uh, when we play all things together, it doesn't sound all that in tune. Okay, so sometimes you have to be patient. This is called tuning. I'm going to get it in tune. This is called the pastor who didn't practice this before. Don't worry about getting lunch. We're feeding y'all today. But you see, sometimes our life requires work. And sometimes we have to do it right in front of everybody else. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things. All right. It's not perfect, but it sounds a little closer to an actual instrument of worship. And, and this is kind of how our life is, you know. It can look beautiful, but it doesn't sound so good when it's played. This one still doesn't sound so good, but this is how, just how some of us are, you know. Oh, Jesus, how great. sounds so much better now. this is kind of like our Christian faith. You know, sometimes it's, we, God has done a wonderful work and He's restored us and we begin to express our worship the same way that the Israelites begin to express their worship by building golden calves, by doing all kinds of other things. And it's not so much that they're out of alignment with God, they just may be in tune, out of tune with one another. And sometimes whenever the church begins to not be united when we're not in harmony, when we're not working together, when we're not working on our relationships, when we're just concerned about who we are and not how we fit in with everybody else, what happens is, is that our expression, our worship begins to sound out of tune. And I believe that God is calling us to this a spirit of unity, a spirit of hope, a spirit of harmony within the church. This is the next generation church. And this is why I, I, I believe that unity is so important. And worship team, you can come. Nobody can play that guitar, though, until it gets tuned. But, but how, I want to just, just kind of just hit my points one more time. My first point was uh, unity does not mean the same, but it does mean together. And for anything to be together, it has to work together. It has to be in unity. It has to be in, in one accord. And my last point for this morning is that there is power when believers come together in unity. Come on. I mean, maybe I should have just led with this, but there is power when believers come together in unity. Matthew 18, verse 18 through 20 says this. Assuredly, this is Jesus talking 
to his disciples, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Man, what a powerful truth. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. He says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. You see, Jesus is saying there is power in his word. It says whenever we begin to bind up things on earth, it begins to move heaven. When we begin to loose things on earth, it begins to loose heaven. But this is an important aspect of this. I don't want you to miss it. Because I've seen so many prayer warriors and intercessors and prophets, and they begin to pray, I bind up and I loose. But friends, they are walking in disunity, and they're walking out of accord with the people of around them. See, Jesus says this in Matthew 18. He talks about first, and he says, he says, whoever, in Matthew 18, 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who, who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to, to have a millstone hung around his neck. He says this in verse 7, he says, Woe to the world because of offenses. He says, For offenses must come, but woe to the man for which whom they come. He says, You have to get the offenses out for the power to come in. He talks about the lost sheep. He said, There's those who are lost. And in, in, in Matthew, further down in, in chapter 18, he talks about dealing with the sinning brother. He says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Oh, man. That's a word. I mean, that's the Bible. Go and tell him or her his fault between you and him alone. Well, don't go, don't go to the multitude of counselors first. Come on, be a, be a believer. Go deal with your offenses. You see, Jesus is mentioning these things. It's intentional. He says, because this is going to happen. He says, if he hears you, then you have gained your brother. But if he'll not hear you, take it to one or more. That by the mouth of two or three witnesses, they... Every word may be established, and if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, then let him be like a heathen and a tax collector. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Never bring offenses within the church to the public realm. Oh, man, I could preach a whole message. I'm going to never bring offenses in the church to the public realm. You have no right to bring your grievances with a brother or a sister in Christ to the court of the world. You have no right. You're in sin if you've done that. Somebody needs to come to you and call you on it. This is why there's disunity, discord, misunderstanding. The world, the, the earth is like listening, the world is like listening to the worship of the church and it just sounds crazy and chaotic. Why? Because we're out of tune, we're out of agreement, we're out of harmony. And the enemy wants nothing more than to keep us fighting against one another through offenses, through sin, through deceptions. Jesus gives us instructions. He says, get the sin out. Get the, get the offense out. Get all the hurt out. Get all these things. He says, then whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. I believe that the church is a powerless church. Not because we don't. Not, it's like we believe. So therefore, it's going to happen. I don't believe that your belief is an issue. I don't believe that your faith is an issue. I, I don't believe that your doctrinal positions are an issue. I don't believe that your understanding of the Holy Ghost is an issue. I, I don't believe that these are issues within the church. You want me to tell you what the issues of the church is? Offense, bitterness, anger, frustration, misunderstanding, gossip. And whenever we begin to get these things, then we have a powerful church. Then whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Then whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When we begin to play in one accord, in one mind, there's power in unity. Because there's power when we come together. Heaven and earth is moved. Jesus is in our midst. And I just want to fin finish with this, this, this last aspect. It says here in the book of Acts. It says this in the book of Acts chapter 2. It says, And then the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. In other words, they were in 
unity. They were in radical unity. They had come together. They had come into agreement. They had come into one accord. They had come into one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And the whole house was filled where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the church was born and, and, and the people came together. They were unified and they were filled with power. They were filled with unity, radical unity. And they began to preach and they began to prophesy and people began to be healed and, and set free and saved. Why? Was it because they have some new knowledge? No, it was because the Spirit of God had come and they had washed away all of their junk, their bitterness, their offense, their anger. All these things that the enemy wants to do to us. So this is what I want to do this, this morning. We're just going to close in a time of worship and prayer. And again, we got lunch today, so you don't have to rush out for lunch. And they're already getting it ready. And Lord Jesus, bless the food in Jesus' name. Good. I want, but I want us to take some time right now. And I want to get, can we get the junk out? Can we just take some time and come into unity? And say, man, there's some of us here who are still carrying offenses. And it's keeping you from operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, there's some of you who are still carrying hurt. And it's preventing you from operating in the power of the Holy Ghost. There's some of you who are carrying things that are keeping you disunified from the church and ultimately disunified from Christ. There's some of you who may not even know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You may never say, man, I am still like an old wretched guitar under somebody's bed. There's beauty in there, but man, it's going to take some work. Some of you may never have made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can do that today. That's where it starts. So this is what I want to do this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team, if you could stand with me as we just prepare our hearts this morning. Unity in the spirit, unity in faith. Lord, I just pray unity right now. Unity in Jesus' name. Lord, I just come against every work of the enemy. I bind up a spirit of gossip. I bind up a spirit of offense. I bind up a spirit of, of just misunderstanding and miscommunication. Lord, I bind up every work of the enemy that's in this house, Lord. And we just stand together in radical unity. Lord, I take that first step of faith to say, I will be united in Christ. As the worship team just begins to play, come on, it says where two or three are gathered together. I, I want us to come and respond. If you want somebody to come into agreement with you this morning, if you say, man, I've been fighting this battle. I have been, I have been so broken and hurt. I feel so disconnected from the body of Christ. I don't want to feel disconnected anymore. What I want you to do is just come to the front right now. Just come to the front. Come on, this is, we're all family here. If you feel broken and disconnected, just come to the front as the worship team begins to play. And we're just going to, our altar ministry team is just going to come and we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God just to do a restoring work in your life. Amen. Amen. If you will, if you just take that time, we'll take these next few moments. Come on, if you need prayer, if you need healing, if you need restoration, would you respond right now? In Jesus' name.
hallelujah. Come on, right now, every hand in the air, come on, right now. Lord Jesus, we just come to you, Father. Lord, we stand united together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I pray that every offense, every root of bitterness, Lord, every mistrust and misunderstanding, Lord God, Lord, every hurt, every scar, Lord, every, every you begin to just heal. Lord, just let your Holy Spirit come into this place, Lord, and begin to heal, begin to restore, Lord, the life of believer. Lord, let it come into perfect unity, perfect harmony, Lord God, that we can be once again an instrument of worship, an instrument of praise, an instrument of hope to this world. Lord, that judgment comes and, and begins in the house of the Lord. So Lord, I pray that right now, Lord, bring us into unity. Lord, bring me into unity. Bring me into harmony, Lord. Lord, help me to be a vessel of your work in this earth. And we thank you for it. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Come on, and it's with one voice that we say together, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we give the Lord some praise this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.